So thank you for joining us and uh, thank you Paul for coming to the museum and doing this talk. Uh, Paul Wong is an award-winning artist and curator known for his pioneering early visual and media art in Canada, founding several artist-run groups and organizing events, festivals, conferences and public interventions since the 1970s. Wong has produced projects throughout North America, Europe and Asia. His works and public collections of the National Gallery of Canada, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Vancouver Art Gallery, and the Whitney Museum in New York, among others. This event is actually in conjunction with a recent exhibition called Paul Wong, Private Public Lives. Uh, it's a project uh, initiated by the Premier Art Foundation uh, in Delhi. The foundation aims to build a strong base for contemporary art practice and theory by developing, a national, uh, by developing national and international partnerships. So I would like to thank the, the team from Premier and Paul Wong for being here tonight. And I hand over to Paul who can start the... Thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Very old, old museum. Um, we had a great tour going through the uh, current exhibition, and uh, what a great introduction! Because I understand um, a lot of the contemporary art um, uh, la language. Um, I'm self-taught. Uh, since the 70s, I picked up a video camera, which at that point was fairly new, and have really never put it down. Uh, that's this um, image is from 1977, and I'm doing a three-camera shoot for, I guess, a three-channel installation called Rock Garden. So back then, that is a Sony, uh, what they called the Rover porta pack which kind of revolutionized everything. Um, each unit with battery pack and cameras was like 45 pounds. Um, but it was the first kind of um, video recording device, sync sound, black and white gritty with tapes, that um, revolutionized mobility. It was the first time that video uh, could be used outside of a studio, a corporate studio, a government studio, a big television studio, um, and um, you know, collectively we were able to buy these as a group of artists and um, share it and make work with it. Uh, it was very liberating. It was very liberating to be able to make and record and reuse tape and make our own stories and play around with our own images. I and mean, it was also picked up by a lot of counterculture, political activists, uh, feminists, um, uh, um, community groups. Uh, shortly thereafter, they also started experimenting, making their own documentaries, and together a lot of us became the kind of media democracy, experimental artists, uh, pioneers. And we all thought that we would change the world, that we, by having this tool, we would have access to all of that, that was always controlled by big cinema, government production, commercial brands, and, uh, you know, mainstream television. Um, uh, you know, we had the tool, we're able to kind of make things that could be broadcast, that could be distributed, that could be shown in cinema, but really, um, they didn't want us. They, they detested us. Uh, it was low quality, we weren't trained, it wasn't high enough resolution. Basically, our stories were just not what they wanted. They wanted traditional, dominant culture, mainstream, government, commercial interest, mitigated stuff. Um, we were outsiders. And now I thank them very much for actually um, ignoring us detesting us and uh, making us play outside on our own. So that's what I did. You know, we developed our own um, playgrounds 
and our own experimentation. And it really allows someone like me to not be part of that inside, but really to go outside now and then really to do our own thing for our own friends and family and communities and develop our own means of production, exhibition, uh, criticism and, and, and distribution. So that's kind of got me to here, where now something like this is my primary tool. It's got a uh, you know, better production quality than anything around that time be it cinema or government, and it's all kind of here. So this is kind of where I crunch a lot of my ideas out, I do a lot of my GIFs, my animations, um, you know, uh, my storyboards, uh, my recordings. Um, I've been recording and shooting images non-stop since I've been in India now for the first time for three weeks. I arrived in Delhi three weeks ago and did a series of talks and an exhibition. Uh, I'm in Bangalore giving a uh, almost one month master classes uh, as part of an international residency program at uh, Schwitzi uh, Institute of Art and Technology. There's going to be an exhibition of the collaboration with the students and faculty opening December the 12th. And then I'll go off onto Kochi, uh, but, uh, where I'll also be giving a talk there on the 18th. So. Um, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, I've never, you know, I've always wanted to come to India, and uh, so, wow, uh, uh, I'm here uh, to look and to listen and to also share what I do. Um, maybe we should play that first video, uh, which is called Troubleshooters. Uh, this is kind of a recent collaboration with a young, young first-time filmmaker, where they put together um, uh, a senior activist with queer youth, and it was part of a very intensive kind of week a workshop with the youth, and a series of portraits were made, including this one. And it's called Breaking the Silence. The young filmmaker named Jax, his first film. And this came out in August. We've all been in fear. Fear of the others and fear of ourselves. What would it be like to have a fear? You know, I grew up with people doing this. Take a cheeky child. Hey. Walking down the streets, I would just do this. Sitting on a bus, I would try to do this. They would do it overtly or shortly. You know, some other people didn't, didn't see it. And that used to be very upset. Through this one gesture, they were able to racialize you, bully you, offend you, have power over you. My name is Paul Wall. I'm a child of the 50s. I'm 63. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I come from a history, of a family history, a class history, a racial history that was based on colonial exploitation and rejection, where you were not allowed, you weren't allowed. You know, uh, we came to this country as indentured workers, the most dangerous jobs that nobody else wanted at the lowest wages, and treated with inequality, and all that goes with that. So we're going to put up with that shit. I was almost born genetically with rejection. That I didn't really belong here and that I should expect less. Because that's what the immigration policies, specifically in this place, expected of us. Growing up with parents who had gone through all of that, who were willing to put up with all of that, and who wanted the best for us, and of course, wanted us to be safe. So we were expected to be silent. We were expected to be model citizens. We were pushed to be most mainstream as possible, to assimilate and be doctors, lawyers, and good accountants, not to be radical artists, certainly not to be out loud 
out and queer. You know, the silence already going on within mainstream dominant culture values. Segregated Chinese and isolated Chinatowns. You know, there was no room for dissent. It was just be, be quiet. So my role as an artist is really going to break that silence. It's so important to visit, to come out of depression and silence. What does that mean? And it means claiming a space. Claiming a space for any my specific small role, a creative space, myself and others, to express oneself with as much freedom as possible. Now I've tasted moments of creative freedom. Just little moments. And they have been like, wow. And I have tried it. And see others given that bit of creative freedom, what they can do. So play. I started um, um, kind of getting involved when I, in high school, um, and right out of high school, you know, I got involved with, um, I was really impacted and influenced at that time by the counterculture, you know, that the hippies, um, the, the, the lefties, the Angela Davises, the Black Panthers, the American Indian movement, I guess even the Maoists to some degree, the, the unionists, who were, really were the first to say, wait a minute, you know, they were the first post-World War II generation to go, wait a minute, there is more than one dominant culture and one dominant way, one, more than one way of thinking. And they started to reject institutional values, academia, formal art practices, uh, traditional film and theater, uh, and, and ways of working and thinking. And, and certainly, um, I found myself you know, really influenced by those politics, but really by more senior artists who had rejected painting, sculpture, printmaking, and picked up the, the camera, uh, started slinging mud and doing performances and, you know, uh, doing festivals in the woods and listening to crazy music and um, just kind of abandoning the art object but making art nevertheless and still making a lot of that art with the same kind of traditional thinking but no longer sitting in a studio by themselves, you know, doing that same painting over and over and over again. And they started collaborating and started to work on other kinds of, of media. So I kind of walked in at that time. So that's the really only thing I, I've known because I didn't go to academia. Um, I mean, one of the things that was very different in Canada um, is because of the vast amount of the youth is that we do have, um, and, and um, being quite a young, wealthier country, um, we have a great system of public art support. You know, we have municipal, city, provincial, national, and even private um, types of art funding that you could kind of propose and do projects for the public good, for the public art gallery. And they, early on, a lot of those public agencies, those were, early, they were also early in development in response to Canada trying to have its, develop its own national identity and its own um, cultural values that were different from the mother country, the Britain, and our very persuasive neighbor, 
USA runs along our border. So there was a lot of attention put, put in to develop Canadian driven content. So as it turned out, part of it was supporting a lot of these counterculture projects, including experimentation and community activists and documentary forms with, with video. Now this next work um, happens to be a work that I made when I was given access to an artist run center for several days who had borrowed a color video camera of, of, that the Canada Council was, circula so was circulating around to artist groups. So this is a work based on my first use of a color camera in 1976 and it's probably about one of a dozen works produced over two or three days in, in, in studio. So it's all edited in the camera and it only works in color and it's a collaboration with Ken Fletcher and it's called a Body Fluid. Because uh, back then, you know, I was really influenced by a lot of, uh, like, uh, you know, artists working. We turned our cameras on ourselves and our friends and our neighbors uh, uh, for content. It was a way of creating our own images and representation. So I'm going to play the whole thing. It's only like four minutes. You know, at that time, there was a lot of early feminists who were turning the cameras on themselves, a lot of performance artists turning on themselves. Um, so I wasn't, you know, I was really influenced by what was going on.
Yes, when that, when that work was, made, was done in 76, you know, it was part of other types of body art, performance art, performance for the camera, stuff that artists were doing. You know, even ballet and modern dancers you know, had rejected the idea of representational and expressionistic dance and were doing things like just walking or falling down or rolling and that was considered dance and, and, and movement. I mean, this particular work, um, I think people continue to sometimes find it shocking um, that, um, you know, we were young and innocent. We had, we had no idea what was going to happen when you mixed two, two different blood types that would actually create this bruise. And we were experimenting. This was probably shot over an hour, and we turned on and off the camera. Uh, to, to, make, to create the time lapse, because there was no video editing back then yet. Uh, so that was a way of working with time and space and doing a performance for the ca camera in private for ourselves and maybe sharing it. A lot of works never got shared or got shared once with six other people and lost in time and space and the tape we recorded, because a lot of times due to lack of budgets, we just did things and then the next day, erase that tape. The following week, erase that tape to, re to reuse it. Because that was quite that was quite a thing. That with magnetic tape, you record and re-tape over it. Um, and this is um, really a classic video artwork in my repertoire, and it keeps getting rediscovered over the decades by different communities who have stumbled on it for the very first time. Um, certainly during the AIDS pandemic. In the early 80s into the mid 90s, showing this work within that context was very powerful because that was something that none of us knowingly would do now share needles and share blood. So, this is innocence lost, um, a kind of um, Kind of, kind of find very beautiful. Uh, it was a long time before I could even watch this work. Uh, the collaborator, uh, who was also a high school friend of mine, he committed suicide a couple of years after this work in 1978. And now I look at this work and go, yeah, he's in. We are actually our blood brothers because we were kind of doing this as a blood brother act then when we did these series of work, not knowing. But now people see this work in terms of um, race relationships and race representation and look at this in terms of a white and a brown body and what, and what does that say and of course now it's also being seen historically as a work of video art half inch color video art and also as become a performance art so it's a work that simple as it all is it, it, it seems to have captured um, an, 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 you know, a, a very interesting moment um, kind of segueing back to that earlier, that first work, the recent work, I mean, this is, I know that, you know, here in India has been a really important move forward, you know, in equal rights for the gay and lesbians, transgender communities, and you're just at the start of that journey, and those stories, and those lives of what's, what coming out of the closet might look like and might mean. You know, we in Canada have embraced that change for a little bit longer. And, um, you know, that project, um, Troublemakers 3, the third year that a number of agencies, including the Queer Film Festival, has spearheaded this kind of collaboration of trying to, before it's all gone, to um, and have the youth do it, uh, to, to ask these activists more about them and the roles that we may have played in pioneering um, um, queer history. And the uh, same thing, there's a lot of these history projects being done by performance artists or by feminist or political activist groups going, huh, what happened uh, 50 or 40 or 30 years ago? So um, having this young man who knew nothing about me, who kind of put together with me, um, uh, just to the process, interview me and ask these very direct uh, questions out of curiosity, where it was not about my latest project 
or anything about me. It was really wanted to know what was, what was, how was, where was, boom, from a very innocent kind of, and which reminded me of um, my innocence of being having being able to allow, as an artist, start asking questions and, and to play. And that's the same thing that I've been doing in Bangalore with my young students, trying to give them back that same sense of a, a place to, uh, to be expressive and to be allowed to ask those questions and seek those, those answers without, you know, academia or parameters or too many restrictions. Because I think that's still controlling the story and the flow and, 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 and um, uh, the, the, the form. Um, I'm going to segue to work on murder research, um, which is a uh, collaboration with Kevin, Kevin Fletcher, just to kind of show you um, another early work, and then we're going to skip to really current stuff. And this is a project shot in 76, exhibited in 77, and it's a series of photo, uh, photo text uh, essay. That's an exhibition as a, and as a book called Murder Research. And it is, you can just go through them. Um, um, so it's a series based on 18 color photographs and uh, other black and white and textual information. Um, it is a case study and a look at murder. Uh, a murder in Vancouver, uh, a, a, a very, it's turned out, the most boring, basic, everyday kind of love triangle, alcohol, betrayal, jealousy, misunderstanding between three people that uh, turns into a murder. And it, murder also involves our Aboriginal people. Who are, who are people that were purposefully uh, discriminated against, uh, 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 killed, killed off by disease, and forced into uh, assimilation in the hopes that they would just go away. So our um, Aboriginal population is slowly starting to recover from the hundreds of years of a legalized um, hate and discrimination against them. So this work is actually based on um, nonfiction. But uh, these are photographs of a real uh, crime scene outside where I lived. But the work is, was purposely presented as much of my work with a lot of ambiguity. A lot of my work purposely uses documentary formats or constructed formats to kind of look like documentary or to look, um, uh, you know, I blur fiction and nonfiction. Uh, for me, I think um, any great work of art uh, has got ambiguity to it. Um, a lot of times um, people have looked at these photographs and thought they were like beautifully staged as this kind of big format photography. It was very cinematic, but in fact, um, you know, they were just shot that little 20, I guess that morning, and then just kind of shot from my window and from the street. And then with this work is called Murder Research, and it, it's, it's, I think it's another of my iconic works that have uh, recently been kind of rediscovered again. But it was considered to be quite, um, um, it was, you know, so this is a work that first gave me a lot of national and international attention. That I was very young and that, oh, kind of, kind of, kind of turned the whole world around, you know, f photography. So that's, so that's murder research. Um, uh, and, and recently, um, uh, this work, Six Unit Brews, and a number of other works, um, there was a look at my first 10 years and the people I worked with collectively. And that was a work called um, uh, Main Streeters Taking Advantage. It was a big exhibition, a book, and a huge website that's got lots and lots and lots of clips and images and chapters on takingadvantage.ca. So you want to look at that, my work from 73 to 82, I think, where it's, it's looking at all the stuff that I kind of did, you know, from where I lived and with my friends and pals, a lot of them from high school. 
and we were kind of known as this, I guess they're saying now as this, I like to say radical, but I think they really, really mean this wild kind of art gang that kind of terrorized the city. <laughs> this way they've been, they've been framing it. Other people to, didn't know what to do with us, and we didn't really care because we just were doing what we did. So it's, sometimes you just have to do what you do, and amazing that, you know, um, it's now contextualized and looked at as, you know, edgy and pioneering. And, um, and you know, what, what, what I've done kind of more recently, um, starting really about a dozen years ago, um, I returned to a lot of the way I worked back then. I got simple again. Because I got pretty complicated and, um, um, you know, big projects and narrative and big camera and big productions and you know, big performances and big technology. So about 10, 11 years ago, I kind of shut all that out of my mind and then took some time and then ended up just going back to this digital studio with like one assistant and just started to make work. And I think part of making that work uh, people got really excited and fresh, and I think was part of kind of rediscovered, huh, all right, this is kind of like some of those ideas and the ways he was working before, where I didn't have fancy tools and fancy, you know, titlers and fancy, you know, all of this. So now I, I'm kind of just, um, just kind of knocking it out, and the work is just kind of, kind of flowing, which kind of brings us up to kind of, um, the three works that I've kind of been exhibiting at, um, uh, I mean, it, it was Anushka from um, um, Shrine Empire, the curator of my exhibition, Private and Public Lives, who came up with that title, but she was also the one that suggested that I show, she's done good research, um, Breaking the Silence and Sixteen of Bruise as the opening acts for this lecture. So she even framed that for me, so, that, so that's, Kind of, uh, kind of nice when a curator really can uh, takes the time to uh, filter your work. I mean, the three works I'm showing at uh, Empire Shrine um, uh, uh, are uh, Year of Gift. Um, so I've been doing a lot of public art projects, uh, doing a lot of stuff. Uh, I do a lot of stuff in galleries and in institutions, but a lot of stuff I've been doing just like before really trying to get it out into more public spheres. And so I have a project called Year of Gift, which was commissioned by the Surrey Art Gallery in the suburbs of Vancouver as a projection for this side of this building, which is a uh, recreation and sports community center with a skate park on, on this side, a community garden, and a big transit hub across the street. So this is what the projection looks like um, um, uh, just before dawn. And then there's a little video. Um, and it's all made from GIFs. I discovered making GIFs on my phone um, the year leading up to this. And I would just be pounding out these little animations so doing a series of photographs, um, you know, constantly, you know, while waiting at a red light or even waiting for an elevator or, or standing in a bank lineup was no longer a pain because I could see things and be inspired to click, 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 and then I'll try that as an animation. So really, it's, 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 so it's a, s a series of 300, and you can play silent. Um, I think in this cut, because there's also video mapped on this building with windows. So it was a great way to kind of present a whole series of a year's worth of um, um, GIFs, or an edited selection of, of the year's worth of GIFs, um, called, called Year of GIF. In fact, the year I was making those GIFs, this work was presented in like February 2013. The word of the year for 2012 was GIF. So it all kind of worked out that I was um, um, doing these graphic interface format an animations. So you know, I was concerned with um, um, a lot of these I was just doing to share with friends. I could do that and send it. Um, I could actually post it on social media, which you couldn't kind of do before. Uh, it was very complicated to do. GIFs allowed you to do that. And also, um, a couple of different um, applications had social media, you know, platforms. So it was the first kind of getting things out there right away. So a lot of this stuff was just made and boomed, boomed out there. Um, and because 
these are all stills. Just click, 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 click. You can make sense of it. There's not a whole series of moving pictures edited together, so it's not jagged. So you see, you know, my, my, my interest in RGB, color studies, selfies, uh, abstract movements, uh, doing, free, doing screenshots, uh, playing, seeing a color field somewhere, seeing blinking lights, uh, you know, seeing anything kind of moving. Um, you know, I ran towards it and said, I can make a GIF from that. Uh, using vertical and horizontal shapes, architecture, uh, travels, parties, uh, screenshots of television, um, and then now they're, they're, these have got all organized and cut into kind of overlapping themes uh, in this five minute um, um, short projection on the side of a building. So that's showing um, as part of my exhibition at Shrine Empire. Um, this is um, how I take every day. And this, that fact, this young man is coming up, this little section, he's kind of my first Facebook friend. He was a young person who came into my life and said, I really like what you're doing, I want to hang out. Will you be my mentor? And I said, you got to get on Facebook. I wasn't on Facebook because none of my peers would touch it. Suddenly, you know, I was part of his world of Facebook and, and, and sharing. So, you know, I, you know, he's, you know, he was the first to kind of like, to take my, 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 my images of him and share them and not give me a photo credit. Like, so what's, you know, I was kind of like assaulted by all this kind of other way of memes and sampling that this generation was doing because I was being taught very, very ethically and we controlled all our images and was very precious about our stuff and the fine arts. And the, so I finally realized that making this stuff I didn't own it any, anymore. Put, the minute I put it out online, it was out there. And um, it, was, it was kind of a way of loosening up and not overthinking about what I'm going to post or not post or it's, or it's perfect. It is what it is. So, um, um, yeah, so embracing coming from an analog and then being, a third, you know, being part of this digital culture has been amazing. And, 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 and playing with all these developing ways of making and sharing and posting and editing um, in this kind of online world. But then to take that and to create, you know, this architectural projection. And then to see this now shown in a gallery, we've kind of gone all the way back. So, because when you make a, a GIF on the phone, you know, it's not about quality. It's really low resolution. That's why it works. That's why, but why it's shareable. So that's another way of going back to my original roots of saying, you know, I'm working with it with whatever I got. You know, I don't need the big format camera with the perfect lighting. You know, I don't need the stylus. The, you know, you know the, and all the and all the lights. You know, so just accepting and working with what you have um, shows that uh, it, you know it, it works. Um, the next work we'll move on to is um, showing an empire shrine. It's called um, Five Octave Range, and it was a commission by Vancouver Opera last year. I was um, commissioned to do a project, a work that would, that would be part of their first opera festival. They were also trying to loosen up and make opera more lively and accessible. And I ended up doing this commission. Um, let me play the documentary. So it was um, out in this plaza for two and a half weeks. Every night, I decided to do, I wanted to do a piece not inside, but outside. Um, So I wanted to create a work that still retained the epicness, the beauty, the magic of opera. And for me, opera, which I don't really know that much about uh, intellectually or historically, um, and, and really after going to a lot of operas, I can say that I'm not a huge opera fan. 
but I do love the operatic craftsmanship of the voice. I do love singing, and I do love what these opera singers bring out. The soprano, the mezzo-soprano, the tenor, the baritone. So I recorded, um, uh, I had a number, I set up a studio and had a, a number of very specific professional singers come and perform for my camera. Can we turn this up a little? Is there volume somewhere in there? Yeah. Because it hurts to be heard really loud. So on this plaza, these round eight foot screens are arranged in a half circle with speakers facing in. On the other side, the speakers are facing out. So you could walk and interact through these loops where the center is just a coffee of sound coming at you. As you get close to any specific speakers, you would be more isolated. When you went to the other side where they're facing out, you could kind of get the purity. each of the singers to come to studio. We selected one signature song from a classic opera that's part of their repertoire. The second song I asked them to bring was a personal favorite. And then what I also recorded specifically was their warm-ups. How they all warm up their voices and do their vocalizations. And when you have an opera singer let's say in a room this size. Opera singers, unlike pop stars, who like to sing in big dead studios with perfect, microphone, with perfect microphones, opera singers don't like to sing with microphones, but they like to sing in a room that is very, it's very specifically echoey, where they can hear their own vibrations come back at you. So to have these opera singers perform for me, when I'm trying this close, these quarters, and to, you know, kind of perform for my cameras, it was, wow, you know, I think after each session, and as I'm doing it, I was already thinking about it. And they knew that I was going to, you know, cut out the work any which way I want. They knew that I didn't want, but, what do you say? So each of the edits, um, the spot was the next person. Go back here. That's right. Um, I was ready um, um, you know, using my phone and different apps to just kind of generative stuff and split screen stuff and, 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 and mixes. But I also did the, this casting very specifically to, to um, include diversity. You know, people um, who were obviously queer, um, but also Aboriginal. Um, Marion Newman, um, who, is a, who is a soprano, um, you know, her favorite song that she bought to perform was done in the Kwakutl language. And it's something that she wrote when she was eight based on her mother and grandmother's baby lullabies. She was a little baby. So she does that in you know, a very disappearing language called Kwakutl. Um, 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 the mezzo-soprano, Teisha Karahara, who is German-Japanese, um, is a butch queer woman who is quite vibrant. I never met her before, um, but she was the last person to record, and she just blew me away. But she came to perform in, in a costume that she was comfortable in. She arrived from another city, Toronto, with a white and black tuxedo. 
Because normally she would have to perform as a femme. So as a woman who's butch and queer, she got to perform in a tuxedo and do her hair up the way that she wanted to for my camera. Because the rest of the time, you know, she would be, you know, in the classical femme or, you know, tr traditional costume of some sort in, in opera. And of course, um, the drag, uh, Joel Klein, uh, who's baritone, um, uh, who's also a professional baritone um, singer, he had recently done a cabaret in drag. So that material comes from his opera cabaret. And uh, uh, Robert, uh, who, is, who, is, who is French, performs in, in French and then in also traditional opera. Um, so th this was, these were um, just allowing opera singers to get out of that usual frame they're always, always in. And also to put, you know, the idea of privately performing for me and allowing the audience to get out really close, not sitting in the balconies in these big theaters to really kind of, I really wanted to share the experience they gave me performing for me, which is like, like, right, like right there and, and being very, very open. So it was, I think, a very successful uh, you know, public art project that anyone could just come to over that two and a half weeks. Um, the third um, um, project that um, you're exhibiting, um, uh, or just finished exhibiting at uh, Shrine Empire in Delhi is uh, a couple of, well, the first projects from Occupying Chinatown, which um, I'm partway through a year-long residency in Vancouver Chinatown, where um, I had proposed to the Chinese Classical Garden been wanting to do something, and I said, why don't we do develop a year-long residency? You've never had an artist in residence in here. What would that look like? You know, I could do a new num number of new works, I could do collaborations, events, and, and workshops. And it turns out, um, I had proposed, I, just before that, I had discovered, after my mother's death, these 700 and plus letters written to her over 65 years from friends and relatives in China. And I can't read or write. I can understand her local dialect. So the letters became the kind of starting point and focal point for this year-long residency, which started in March of this year. Um, and um, I've been getting these letters translated, and I've been letting these translations my mother's letters tell me what to do. So they've led to a number of, of, of projects that really, um, um, it's one of those projects that's also funded by the city of Vancouver. As this the garden I were talking about, you know, come and please do a residence, come and do something. That's what, let's do this year long residency, we'll need some funding. The city of Vancouver um, happened to announce this new program called Artist Initiated commissions where the artist could propose whatever you wanted to propose with your own budget. It wasn't most public art commissions that say, you know, we've built this building and we need the artist to do something with three of the windows. We've got this plaza and we need an artist to do the bench. We've got this wall, we need an artist to do the mural. Or we have a school program and we need the artist to come and do, you know, a performance, you know, performance class or something. You know, everything's always got a frame. So I was, very, I was successful. I was one of six artists um, that got this commission. And five of the six projects are ephemeral. None of them have to do with a permanent mural or a broad bust or a sculpture. A lot of the works are kind of ephemeral and in development and kind of involved with community engagement. So having that freedom um, uh, and, 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 and the city of Vancouver to recognize that public art not, can be ephemeral. It doesn't have to last forever and that um, we can engage the public in other ways besides sculpture and monuments and uh, things that need to be permanent or things that need to be safe or need the things that have to be built to last forever. Um, so I've come up with a series of works um, in Occupying Chinatown um, which kind of pay homage to my mother and to the women 
the, si the silence of most of the women in Chinatown's history. Um, let's look at, um, right, so at the, at, at the, at the garden, I'm, um, sorry, let's go to the first one of the book. So um, we'll go to the, ad, yeah, let's go to the ads, where is that? Ads. So in Vancouver right now, um, um, there's a series of, where's the bus ads? Just play these. Um, you know, in the, in the letters, um, in one of the letters from my grandfather, which was in, uh, earlier on, one of the first things that got translated, there was a discussion, there was a, he, had, he had reported very carefully in all his letters any money that he might have gotten from other people. And in one of the letters, he talked about how he was very weak, sp specifically needed to make soup that would warm him and make him stronger. And within that listed three herbal medicinal ingredients, which led me to my mother's cupboards to look for some of those ingredients. And I ended up now photographing those in ingredients and curating them by brand, and now they've become a public art project at 45 bus stops around Vancouver. So we have red lids, uh, uh, Nally's, oops, classical pasta, red lids, Taster's Choice, Miracle Whip. Uh, this is a Elmer's product of some sort. Uh, and there's a giant miracle whip. And these compounds here are medicinal uh, concoctions, some external, some we're adding to soups that she made, which I don't have, a, which I don't have uh, recipes for or know nothing about. So they've now led me taking these uh, to Chinese herbal, herbalists and identifying what some of these products are and also match them to the dry goods that were in her cupboard. And now it's leading to kind of giving us a number of workshops deconstructing these. So these jars are now also available as big photographs, which I just showed at Empire Shrine. So that's Mother's Cupboard. And of course, it's amazing the response to these. I mean, they only went up last week and on social media, well, a month ago now, it's been on the road, and almost everyone said, oh, that's like my mother. That's like my grandmother. It's in like recent memory. I mean, the weird thing is, all these people saying this in recent memory are not doing this anymore. If they do collect things, you know, they've gone to the dollar store or to Ikea, they've thrown away perfectly good glass jars to buy, you know, cheap matching plastic and, you know, you know white matching jars. The idea that people don't use jars is kind of lost in, in a planet that's, you know, this landfill. So this talks about the generations that valued things like charts. So this is also shown, shown at um, um, the recent exhibition that closed yesterday in Delhi. And this is the first um, series of works to come out of the letters. So these three letters um, uh, which are also going to be shown coming up uh, in January in Vancouver as bus stops, um, are three letters uh, called Father's Words, which are uh, my mother's letters from my mother's father. The first letter that she received in the early 1960s, um, I think this is the letter that has the things about the herbs. The second letter is from the early 70s during the Cultural Revolution. So that's why it's in those red and yellow colors. And the third letter um, is this last letter, uh, talking about um, when is she gonna come to visit? Would love to see you, heard you might want to come, but it's okay if you can't come, it's expensive, I'm, o I'm okay. And all these letters were, which I never knew about, were also very carefully written. Because he, can we see the triple letter again? The three? Um, was heavily persecuted, as were all the family, because they were considered to be of the intellectual merchant and bourgeois class after communist takeover. So he was sent to labor reform camp in the 50s, 
had his legs broken and never healed properly and uh, was heavily uh, brutalized. Uh, his wife, my grandmother, uh, committed suicide because uh, there was no more gold to give up. All the properties were confiscated. So my mother was the only one to be in Hong Kong that didn't flee back in. She married my father and came to Canada. So she's the only one of her eight brothers and sisters to um, not be trapped inside communist China. Uh, so I think the burden on her uh, was tremendous. But all these letters are very carefully written as well. Because of course, it could undergo censorship and be read because it was international mail going to bourgeois overseas Chinese connections, which was kind of, and there's a lot of silence between these letters because there was gaps where it really was not safe to write and get ma mail out at all. So those are the, the letters um, I've only been able to afford to translate just a small portion of them. Some of them are absolutely breathtaking, some of these collections of what is revealed much later on in terms of um, what happened to people's lives. And um, which, you know, for someone like me, you know, in a place like Canada, or, or for those of you who have migrated here, or other, you know, people have migrated to other places, you know, most of us don't do it because we want to. You know, most of us do it because we're looking for better opportunity. Political, religious freedom, economic freedom, free, you, know, uh, you know, sexual freedom, um, feminist freedom. Um, you know, we do it out of need. You know, so it, it's, it's kind of, this is very universal. So this, so this is just kind of the start of, of, of many um, um, uh, projects. I think we open these questions. I have a few more samples. I don't think it's necessary. Approaches. Anything about any of the works I've shown that you'd like to respond to? I'm going to show you my early work and my most recent work. I mean, today was really interesting. Um, um, midday, which is a newspaper here, contacted me yesterday. And they wanted to me to walk around and respond to public art. And I said, I've only been here for 48 hours. But anyway, this morning, um, we met at my hotel. And I showed them photos of the stuff I'd done for two days. But I responded to them, and they were like, what? So we kind of did a walkabout. And um, just showing them what I see. I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's a bit, you know, I don't really know much about this place. Um, so I was a bit intimidated. You know, I'm just barely surface tourist here, but I don't really feel that it's my place to um, make comments. But on, on, the, on, on the other hand, you know, I'm making little videos, making little gifs, making little stuff from what I took, like, you know, instantly. So I am looking, and I'm feeling, and, you know, um, you know, I did a walk about, you know, it was, you know, to Elephant Island. That was part of my first two hour and a half walk. I thought, well, yeah, maybe I should do that. That seems to be what everyone does around here. But, you know, I read a bit about it before. I Googled it. I saw all the images. I was like, do I really want to spend four hours? What everyone doing this <laughs> about the site to prove that they've also been there. And the photos that I already saw online, I've already read a web page. I've already been there. So really, I just I ended up just walking the opposite direction and then going and hanging out at, uh, at, at uh, the market as Sassoon's Wharf with the, with the fisher folk. And where I went back again today with the photographer and the crew. So I mean, you know. We've turned into this whole world where we all want to be for the travel purposes, the travel pur purposes where everyone else has been. And we all see, you know, the Mona Lisa or that statue or the 
check the missing unit in there as well. When really, that's all people are doing. And I do that too, so it's not a risk. And then I find myself doing so the, the need to be, and then really, um, and I said, you've been to Indian Gate, so I lived for two minutes from there. Thank God I walked there early, and there was some crowds there. It's, it's a commemoration of King George <laughs> landing here that says, I'm here and I own this place. It's not even a pretty monument. So, what's the big deal? And why are we all going there? And somebody else has planted in their signature, kind of like this building, which is also being reclaimed now in terms of turning turn it over. So, anyway, um, I didn't visit either of those monuments. So. Because uh, I can see it on Instagram by somebody else. I'm about to make my final. So I just wanted to know, when did you start making those GIFs? I started doing my first series of GIFs was in 212. I did it, I, did, I just kind of got onto them and turned into a year long, and this was a summation. And then the second year, um, I ended up doing a, another project called Looking, Looping, and Listening which turned out to be like a feature film, but instead of judging on a wall, I think I had like a wall that large with digital frames, just as cheap kind of photos, kind of hung salon style. And that ended up being hundreds of GIFs, lines, and Instagram videos. Uh, um, it totally good lines at all about being like 75 minutes. So I think of it as this feature film that you can have little hints. And then each of those things had like maybe now just seven different short videos or fresh of gifs or Instagrams. And I started doing vines that year. It was the first time you could shoot a low resolution video, 6.5 seconds of course on the line. So I got really good making the perfect
revealing. Just the act of recording that, holding up this mirror, which I can record your voice, and then seeing yourself. Because saying that, or doing that, already is hey, self-acceptance. So I did a workbook seven-day activity, which I was done shortly after six degrees, when I got the camera for a longer period of time. And where over seven days, I did seven different beauty treatments around my very terrible eye, which I felt very bad. And then I had different friends, you know, give their opinions of what I should do. Many days of treatments from steaming, from squeezing, to you know, hot towels, cold towels. I just did this kind of mirror thing. I just sat there and did all this stuff, you know, and um, put it out there. And that was a form of self acceptance because I used to be embarrassed and ashamed and about that. Someone would say, I know I had acne. But, Instead of trying to do something about it, make it make sense. Okay. And people seeing it and identifying it. Because I think most of us, I can't speak for all of you, some of us have low self esteem issues. Right? Yeah. And um, you know, it's taken me a very long time to get through the line. Because I think that, oh, by that first video, I think it took me a long time for you to recognize. Now we all know email and phone 
So this is kind of the, the end of a letter writing. You know, it's got a 65 year history. This right here. I really liked your work. Uh, I don't know if I liked it, but I had a strong reaction to your work where you injected blood. So I was just wondering, did you was it dangerous? Uh, did you know it was dangerous? Or? No, we did not know it. Was, no, no, I, I just took. I just still don't consider it dangerous. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we had our yeah. we had our we had our, we, we, we had our, our bodies, and to be quite um, um, you know, to be quite honest and frank, you know, we were sparing back then with everything, including some drug use. And the only person that I would do drugs with is with Ken, and we would share needles. So we already had needles, we knew how to use them, and we shared them, right? And um, um, I've never shot drugs again. Because he was the only person I did it with. It was kind of a thing we did together. I wasn't interested in doing it on my own. And I only ever shared needles with him. So that's kind of something that was completely out of the common. So it was original, as opposed to like seeing a mom and shooting on drugs. It was something that I don't know how people ended up kind of doing it. So that this work kind of came out of that, that the idea that, um, yeah, the idea of sitting in some dirty hotel room shooting out drugs by yourself is, is not, it's not really sexy. The idea of the best buddy getting together and sharing some drugs, sharing a needle, the kind of care that goes with it is, yeah. But you were fine with it. No, we didn't think it was safe. We did not think it was dangerous back then. Okay, so the rules just disappeared. Yeah, disappeared. I mean, I mean, this is really, I don't mean, know, the open eyes and innocence. So it's like, yeah, my question is really technical. I was just curious. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, people making uh, Instagram videos in large numbers these days. Uh, so, do you think? Uh, yeah, the kind of mass culture uh, about of making videos today, uh, it uh, will uh, reconfigure artistic production of videos because and it already has. Uh, uh, if you consider the format of the video, uh, most videos today are like vertical and seen on a vertical device, uh, whereas like 20 years ago. It was an iron rule that videos had to be landscape. So like that has that is already changing. Well I want something you know, took me a while to accept making resolution low resolution stuff yesterday. As opposed to planning and thinking of it. And then just putting it out. Uh, so um, going from the six seconds, five six point five seconds to the fifteen seconds. To, to now longer, um, going from uh, horizontal to vertical to square, um, <coughs> back to uh, not square. But there's all things that, that are challenging because I've always before to be primarily everyday shooting has been in a landscape, and now I'm doing a portrait. So um, um, it's just you adapt. You adapt, there's, you know, there's things you record and delete, there's things that I put through my app and digitize and mix, there's things that, um, 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 I, you know, what happens if I put together every single one of my short, short videos, tomorrow I'll put a shot in the game, every single one, in chronological order, or put them in random order. And I'm sure there's already going to be like 15 minutes now. So, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's, 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 it's just a tool. Uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, uh, in, in, in this world where um, everything is multimedia these days, uh, you know, it, 
and screens of all shapes and all sizes. It's fantastic. Really strange, so it's great culture. But in most cases, you know, um, screens are owned and operated by brands, by corporations, and by government. Um, there is this whole you know, huge now YouTube so P and D, there's all sorts of by YouTube. Uh, there's uh, there's this, 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 this whole other thing that's happened with you know hundreds of million channel channel news universe. I mean, there's a lot more choice than I was going on. Two channels, eight channels, there's six channels, hundred channels to now. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, I think digital culture, I would agree in 50 years, but I really think we are in the primordial, <coughs> you know, uh, uh, really uh, hard time to digital culture. You know, there's some days when things aren't working. I mean, you might remember email 10 years ago, or any of these platforms. It's, we're just starting to get to the point where I can easily move between mediums, pictures, sound, you know, and mix and match and not have anything. <coughs> you know, so I think um, production, delivery, and um, you were, all that is still a bit jagged. So I think it's a really interesting time to be pioneering other ways of being in the digital culture and, and, and shape and explore it. I think it's got a lot of potential. Because it's a very limited opportunity. No, one last question there. Public art has to be related to the people who are staying in that area because uh, you mentioned that you ended up going to the Sisun Dock and then all of the artworks are about the locals who are the Kodis. So, what are your thoughts about this? Your question is Do public artworks need to um, be localized? So, you're asking? They will be related to the people who are there. Does the artwork have to be about the people who are there? Can it be just like an expression for the artist? Um, I think context is very important. I think um, I have been relatively successful because there's nothing worse than doing just the very, very best artwork and putting it in the wrong place at the wrong time. So being a really aware of context, politically, community, Placement, time and place. Um, when is the, you know you have to be conscious why and where you're doing something. Just because something was really successful in A doesn't mean it's going to work in D. I mean I've seen really great artworks by really great artists just go kaboom because they're not street artists. You know they really need to stay in the right cube. You know I've also seen great public artists try to become you know. The, you, know, the, you know, the successful commercial galleries. <laughs> you know, I've seen, you know, really interesting um, media makers try to make, you know, a pop, you know, to work for a brand. So, you know, you can't be all things to all people. You have to be very selective. And some things that are done in communities require a whole lot of sensitive inroad development, um, and others don't. So, um, you know, um, our artists that are going to work in the public sphere have got to be thinking about what that public sphere is. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much.